Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Good morning and welcome to our worship. It is the 17th Sunday in the Pentecost season. Our theme in worship today is really a comment on our struggle with childlike faith. We are called to be peacemakers, and to that call, oftentimes as Christians, making our way through the everyday of life, we shrug our shoulders and say, well, so what? The call is a serious one. The call is a call to reflect the image of the living God in this world and grow stronger in our relationship with Him. Here we are once again navigating now the fourth wave of this pandemic. The green tape is back. Aren't you excited? In the midst of all this, one can be led to confusion and anxiety. But none of this has surprised the living God. He is ready for it. He has seen the outcome of it already. And we are called to take the next step of faith right here and right now, living as His people in this world. So the call to be peacemakers is part of that, and that is one with all others that we take seriously as well. God be with you as we gather and worship today. Our first song this morning is Shout to the Lord. Would you please stand as we sing? begin our worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The scripture reminds us, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
let us confess our sins to God. Gracious Lord, we confess to you that we are by nature sinful. You came to serve all people. We have sought to serve ourselves. Your word exhorts us to be peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere. We confess that we have been quarrelsome, selfishly ambitious, and envious. By our thoughts, words, and actions, we have sown disorder rather than peace and your word. Forgive us, Lord, for the sake of Jesus our Savior. Jesus Christ, who was betrayed into the hands of sinful men, killed on the cross and raised to life for us, has taken your place and sets you free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Therefore, I announce God's forgiveness to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We join again in song. As we prepare to hear our Lord's word, we bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. O God, your Son taught us that greatness is in serving and that peace is in him. Preserve us from becoming friends of this world's ways and help us to be faithful to your word and example. Teach us the ways of peace. Help us to be peacemakers according to your will and give us that peace which the world cannot give. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading for today is from the prophet Jeremiah, the 11th chapter. We are to commit ourselves to our Lord's cause. As we do, we will not be forsaken. The scripture reads, Because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it, for at that time he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we read from the third chapter of the book of James, we are reminded once again that childlike faith is lived, it's enacted in our lives. We read, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't fires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. 
When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for children's message time today, let me ask you, adults as well, do you ever argue about anything? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. If it becomes heated and, and kind of angry toward each other, then there's a problem. But if it's just talking about two different sides, two different opinions, and trying to figure out what's best and meet somewhere in the middle, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Well, in our gospel reading for today, what I'm going to read in just a minute or two, Jesus notices as they're walking along the road that his disciples are arguing about something, and so he asks them about it. And they don't really want to tell them what they were arguing about because you know what it was? They were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. It's kind of like if you're on the playground and somebody says to you, my dad is stronger than your dad or my mom's better than your mom. They were arguing about which one of them was the best and the greatest. And that was missing the whole point. And Jesus reminded them that to be great in his kingdom means to be more like Jesus. And what was he like? He never tried to make himself out to be greatest. He just came to serve and to give his life for you and me. And so we're called to do the same thing. We're called to remember two very important things. First, that the Lord Jesus loves us and he'll never let go of us. So we're safe. And then secondly, because we're safe, we can put others ahead of ourselves because he's going to look after us no matter what. We can show them that Jesus loves them too. That was the message Jesus gave to his disciples, arguing about who was the greatest. The greatest is the one who serves. The greatest is the one who trusts me, and because they know I'll be there for them, they show that they can serve other people and put them first too. And that's our call today. But remember, we can only start to do that when we remember how much our Lord Jesus loves us and has served us. So let's pray and help, ask him to help us to remember that now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to go to the cross for us. You showed us how much you love us, and because of that, we will never be left alone. We thank and praise you for that truth, and we ask that you'd help us to remember it and then to live because of it, to live in a way that shows that we know we're looked after and that your love is for others too. We pray in your own name. Amen.
I invite you to rise as we join in hearing the word of our Lord Jesus as recorded in the gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. The scripture reads, and again, childlike faith is a life that does, or rather a faith that does life God's way. The scripture reads, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what, uh, what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the road they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever becomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join in confessing our Christian faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We join in singing, Lord of glory, you have bought us.
All three of our scripture readings for today really call us to live in childlike faith, the kind of faith that says, my heavenly Father is trustworthy and faithful. When He speaks, I listen. When He speaks, I act and I follow. And with that in mind, I'd like to draw your attention back to our second reading from the book of James, where the scripture reads, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom, the word of our Lord. Wisdom in the Bible always refers to doing life God's way. It has very little to know with how many, or to do rather with how many facts you know or that sort of thing. It has to do with childlike faith. It has to do with hearing God's word and acting upon that basis. So with that in mind today, let's think a little bit about being wise. Being wise and letting that show itself in our lives. Especially these days in our relationships. Friendships, relationships, marriage, peer groups, those are things that form the web of life in our world. They are really very important to us. No person is really an island unto themselves, and no one really wants to go it totally and completely alone in this world. In fact, we all know that these relationships are vital. They're essential parts of our lives. Truth be told, we all want good relationships with family, with spouse, with friends. So what's the problem? If these things, these relationships, are what really matters, then why can't we seem to make them work? Why, too, do we live in a world that seems to devalue these things that are most precious? Why are there so many divorces in our culture today? Why has this pandemic exposed the me-first attitude that lurks just under the surface in so many people? We have more things than ever, more material wealth, more food, more leisure, and more brokenness. Why are so many children growing up without fathers or mothers? We live in bigger houses with cars and cell phones, TV sets and vacations, but we never seem to have the necessary time for hearing God's Word, for talking about it, for teaching, for praying, for even playing in healthy ways, for growing in our families. Why are there millions of abortions every year children discarded like trash when we have the means and the opportunities for life like never before. Well, I'm afraid you're probably not going to like the Bible's assessment of these things. So it's pretty simple. Sin, evil, and our self-serving hearts are the real problems, the root of the problem. But you've got to admit, when it comes to relationships today, we don't know how to do them very well anymore. We need a solution to the jealousy, the selfish ambition, the coarseness of this world. We need a wisdom that not only cuts through all the nonsense, but delivers in time of need. And that's exactly what the Scripture is giving us through the Apostle James today. It's the wisdom that comes down from above, rather. It's hearing God's Word and doing life His way. It offers what we can't provide in and of ourselves, real down-to-earth, practical, but eternal solutions. For revolutionized relationships, the source and power of those things must be a wisdom that is from above, a wisdom that's out of this world, because God himself is the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of the very relationships that we need. There was a young man once who was talking to an older neighbor about a very important event that was coming up in his future very soon. Biggest moment of his life to date, his upcoming proposal of marriage to his longtime girlfriend. Now, this neighbor that he was talking to was more than a friend. He was a confidant who over the years, along with this boy's family, had watched him grow up from a child into an adult. And the earned trust that existed between them allowed the young man to confess to his neighbor that day that he was really nervous. Not that she would say yes or no. He was pretty sure she would say yes. But he didn't know he would be up to the task of being a good husband or if the time came, a good dad. He confessed his hesitation, hoping to hear some, some good counsel from his neighbor that would make the doubts go away, but he got much more than that on that particular day. At that point, the neighbor, the older man, picked up a flower, a red rose that was growing in his backyard, and he handed it to the boy and he said, try to open up this rose without losing any of the petals. Why, said the young man. Just do it, you'll see in a minute. Well, petal by petal he tried, and you guessed it, every one of those petals fell off, wilted, and was dead on the ground. Discouraged and confused by now, he handed the petal back, or rather, rather the plucked rose back to his neighbor, thinking he had absolutely failed. But that was just what the older man wanted. 
He took the boy aside, he opened a book, and he read from the book a particular poem. And I'm not going to read the whole poem to you, but I'll just tell you the poem reminded us that what we are unable to do, open a rose petal by petal, God does every day. So why not trust him for leading and unfolding our lives as well? Why not strive to be his person and to do life his way, to put him first? The poem concluded, I'll trust him to unfold the moments just as he unfolds the rose. The man said, keep your heart and mind on the things of God in Jesus Christ, and you'll be up to the task of being a husband and maybe a father too. Love them as God in Christ loves you. James challenges us to do the same. The poem reminded them of what they are unable to do and how God does it each and every day. And James challenges us to do the same. If you want revolutionized relationships in this world and in the world to come, you're going to need God's supernatural grace and his eternally empowering word. That's why the scripture says, the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. You can only be those things as you grow in a relationship with a faithful father who pours out his unchanging grace and love and favor and salvation on you. So when it comes to relationships, there's a solution to the problem. It's the wisdom that comes from God. It's doing life God's way. That wisdom is more than just good advice. The Bible speaks of true wisdom as a person, and the Bible even calls that person the Word. And that Bible Word is more than just timely sayings or philosophical ideas or religious traditions. It is the way, the truth, and the life, the power that literally created, redeemed, and even now sustains all creation. The Bible goes on to clearly say that this wisdom, this Word is a name. His name is Jesus. And he wants to make his home in you. And he wants to call you to a life of living in his wisdom, of seeing his creation his way, and to following him. The main message of the Bible is the history of how God revolutionizes all relationships, especially those with you and me. His wisdom is pure, and it purifies those who trust in him. His wisdom is peace-loving and peace-giving to those who follow him. It's full of mercy and abundant life to live now and forever. What's needed to revolutionize our relationships is, first of all, a revolutionized relationship with the one who created us and who redeemed us all. And that's what God offers you freely today in Christ his Son. But for revolutionized relationships in Jesus, there's a new challenge too, one that flows out of that new life that comes in connection with him. The Bible summarizes the essence, uh, the essence rather, of this he heavenly wisdom for us in 16, where it reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his son, his wisdom, the word come in the flesh, the way, the truth, and the life. He came down from heaven so that you could have his heavenly wisdom and life in your relationships now and forever. When it comes to revolutionized relationships, there's a new challenge because you are reconciled and restored in your relationship to God. Love others in the way that he loves you. Or as James says, peacemakers who sow in peace because we are at peace with God in Christ raise a harvest of righteousness with one another. Don't give in to your base emotions, your carnal desires. Don't use the tongue to curse Rather, learn to fight those things, to speak encouraging words, both yes and no, but with the goal of bringing people closer to the Savior who loves them and begin to step forward in the power of God's gracious love with a new way of doing things. If God can open up and close roses every day so that bees can enjoy their nectar, so that we humans might enjoy their fragrance and beauty, don't you think he can do the same with your heart? He can open you up in a new way of treating that problem in your relationship or that issue you have with a coworker. He can do it without destroying you or leaving you too vulnerable. Why? Because he's God. He's the one who created you, who loves you, who, who gives you the wisdom that you need to make your relationships work again in him. If you are willing to be open to the leading of our gracious God today, if you desire more in your relationships, more out of your life, then hear the word of God from James. The wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
You can only be those things on a regular basis when you know you've been cared for. So keep Jesus front and center. What he's done in his grace and mercy front and center in your life. And then live like that's true. Because it is. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. I'm amazed what God can do when we seek to be his people doing life his way. Today in this lesson we learn again that this is how God wants it. God calls us to be his own by grace and then to be sowers of his peace, his grace, his generous love to others, just as he continues to be that God of grace and peace for us every single day. Yes, we receive every single day freely. Freely you have received, the Bible says, so freely give. In the power of gracious love in action, given through us, that can transform others too. The power of undeserved forgiveness received and shared can make all the difference in the world. Things don't have to be on a grand scale to make a difference. We live in a broken world. People are sinners, all of us, repentantly in need of real grace. And James reminds us that that grace is given so that we can be peacemakers, children of the Prince of Peace himself, who get to sow his peace patiently and impartially and sincerely in the lives of others, being part of God's harvest of goodness. We can make a difference in people's lives because God is capable of doing miraculous things through the simple service of his people for others. So peacemakers, let's get to it. You won't believe what God can do with your hands, with your brains, with your heart. That must be how Keith Taylor felt. See, Keith Taylor was a person who had benefited from the benevolence, the graciousness, the goodness of many people in his life. Like many Christian people, he had benefited from the generosity of others in different times and in different ways. For example, while Keith was attending graduate school, his car broke down, and the subsequent car repair bill caused him to be short on his rent that month. Fortunately for Keith, his boss at his part-time job paid his rent bill in full, and it was a gift. It wasn't a loan. One evening in 2002, Taylor was reflecting on the kindness of his boss and on other acts of generosity from others who had contributed to the happiness and the stability of his life. Like many Christians, Keith decided that he would, listen carefully, one day dedicate his life to helping others too. One day, one day, one day. When I'm really rich, he said, when I'm stable in life, then I'm going to start an organization to help the working poor. But then the Holy Spirit prompted him to understand something very true and very true for all of us. He was seized by a remarkable thought. He said, all of a sudden, I was led to see that no one, no one who had ever helped me had ever been wealthy. They had just been nice. They had just had compassion. And that's when Keith Taylor was moved from thoughts of grandeur to simple acts of kindness. That's when he began to act as he saw the needs of others, not just when he had the means someday, sometime. So he started small. He decided he would try to help one person every month get through some kind of a problem. So he set aside some money. It might involve that. He set aside about $300. That was about 10% of what he was earning at the time. And he set up a very basic website that invited requests for assistance. When the site was featured on a popular blog, Keith's plans went out the window. He received 1,100 emails the next day. Most were from people requesting assistance, but a surprising number were from people who wanted to help. And that's how modest needs began. The mission of the organization is to prevent otherwise financially self-sufficient individuals from entering the cycle of poverty, when this might be avoided with merely a small amount of well-timed assistance. Like the communities of long ago, where people's tragic needs were met by the strength of communities ready to be in service to each other, Modest Needs is transforming situations of struggle for the last 20 years into opportunities for hope. And it all began because someone didn't wait for someday to be God's person and took action in a very small way that day. I really enjoyed reading the fact that almost 80% of individuals whom that organization helps end up donating money back to the organization sometimes later. 
In other words, kindness produces more kindness, and generosity produces more generosity, which sounds like a great way to love your neighbor. Every day is another miracle, Keith Taylor says. It's beyond my imagination, just because someday became today. Some might say that's even a harvest of righteousness. So if there's one thing to learn today, It is that God has work for all of us to do with those He has brought into our lives. Ready hands, sincere hearts that are willing to sow peace, not just general peace, but God's peace into the lives of others through kindness and concern, through tough love. Those willing, transformed lives can and will bless others because of the power of God's transforming love. Revolutionized, transformed, revitalized relationships. That's what God has in store for you and for me today. Today, not someday, today. Don't go through another day without faith in Him, without the power of His wisdom from above, without His revolutionizing love at work leading you to take steps of faith in your life. And as you do, God will be glorified. And the peace of God that passes human understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ our Savior. Amen. Nancy leads us in music. Let this 
eyeglasses, and an over-the-ear microphone bubbles to the surface. We come before God's throne of grace in prayer and invite you to stand. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we bend down your listening, or rather, bend down your listening ear to us and hear our prayer. We bring to you our thanks and our praise. In your mercy, you answer all of our prayers. We know that you are ever willing to keep our eyes from tears, our feet from stumbling, for your constant care and concern, accept our thanksgiving and our praise this day. You have redeemed us to be your own through the death and resurrection of your Son, Christ our Lord. Yet we have not always lived as your redeemed children. We have catered to those who we think can benefit us and have ignored those who we think can offer us nothing in return. In our knowledge of being justified by faith alone, we have often neglected the good things that should flow from our free salvation. We are often, often tempted to think that our good works deserve your attention. We have often permitted Satan to make us feel that our sins of the past are so great that you won't listen to us. For our thoughts of self-righteousness and our self-condemnation, forgive us, Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us that he may help us to follow your Son, Christ, more closely. Help us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Give us the courage to make sacrifices that your gospel message might reach people both near and far. Give us insight to understand that as we lose our life in service to you and others, we truly find it. Help us to live so that others may learn that you are a good Father whose presence is a reality here on this earth. Lord, we continue to pray for those whose needs we know. We pray for those undergoing treatments for various illnesses that you would grant them an understanding of your presence and that you would grant that the treatments would be of benefit to them. We continue to remember Howard and Paula in their battles with cancer. We hold them before your, your throne of grace and mercy. And we pray that you would give us all patience and diligence as we continue to navigate life during this pandemic. We ask that we would not only look to our own needs, but for the health and well-being of others. May our lives in that way reflect your goodness. Hear us as we pray in Jesus' name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We join in singing praise and thanksgiving.
we come before God's throne of grace in prayer and to hear His words of blessing, I invite you in honor, in His honor, to stand. We pray, Lord, may we be strengthened by Your Word and Spirit for humble service to You and those You send us to serve. For You live and rule with the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen. Please be seated. By way of announcements today, uh, remember that our worship service continues at 11 o'clock uh, through the fall months. The Sunday classes were scheduled to begin first Sunday in February. Whether they are in person or online will be decided in the very near, near future and families will be uh, contacted accordingly. Confirmation class will be upstairs tomorrow night. We're able to distance ourselves, mask ourselves and distance ourselves in the big room upstairs. So those who are involved in confirmation are invited to be there at seven o'clock. Have I missed anything else? Remember to register for in-person service on our website if you're planning to attend in person. Don't think I've missed anything else today? Okay, we'll go to the next slide for a Right Now Media sound. We're living in the most connected time in human history. But how well do people really know you? And how many people know the real you? When we ground our identity in these roles that we play or things that we're good at, our whole self can become consumed. We begin to determine our worth or success by how good we are at them. But the good news is there's a greater, more secure way of identifying ourselves. Let me show you what I mean. Again, for those of you not familiar, uh, Right Now Media is available to everyone free of charge through our congregation. Just click on their logo on our website to create your free account and you have tens of thousands of materials available to you there. That brings our worship to a close for today. Our final song is on what has now been sown. Would you please stand as we sing?
Speak what is true.